From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today, K-State's Dale Blassie reporting on the effect of bunk space availability on the performance of limit-fed beef calves. This study sought to determine how various bunk space allowances would influence calf gains and uniformity of calf performance. And their findings might come as a surprise to you producers. Also from the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McGowan is back, this time to discuss several items that did not make his top 10 ag law and taxation developments for 2021, but nonetheless remain high-profile issues for you producers here in 22. And further ahead with another Stop, Look, and Listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven, here on Agriculture Today. Thanks for tuning in. This is the midweek edition of Agriculture Today. As we've visited in recent times about limit feeding beef calves, which has gained considerable research here at Kansas State University, of late there's been yet another research project which factors in making that feed available to the calves. Along with us now, Dale Blassie. He's a beef cattle nutritionist with K-State Research and Extension. And Dale and one of his graduate researchers just recently finished up work, Dale, looking at limit feeding and the bunk space required to pull that off. But before we get into those particulars, remind us of the concept, what we're talking about when we say limit feeding calves. Well, in essence, Eric, limit feeding, at least the system that we've developed over the course of the last eight or nine uh, research trials conducted since 2016 is to essentially limit the amount of dry matter provided to the calves and basically removing going from 45 percent roughage down to 13 percent roughage and filling that gap with a co-product be it wet corn gluten feed or certainly wet distillers grains and uh, we've achieved results in terms of predictable performance uh, based upon our longstanding NRC requirements for beef cattle and have really determined that uh, this feeding practice for our backgrounders and growers in the state and surrounding states is that uh, we see a manure production, 45%, and an improvement of feed efficiency of about 27 to 30%, depending upon the trial and the certain set of calves that we bring into our research facilities at the K-State Beef Stalker Unit. So this is a practice that's been around since the mid-1980s, but it's a practice given the climate of sustainability and so forth that really needs to be illustrated to our stakeholders out across the state. As you say, it's paid off in feeding efficiency, in reducing the manure output, great benefits to it. But all along, there's been this, well, worry, Dale, about limit feeding and assuring that each animal is receiving the appropriate amount of intake. And uh, that has to do then with the available bunk space. Exactly. And so with limit feeding, we believe our sweet spot in terms of the amount of allowable dry matter expressed on a percent dry matter body weight basis is about 2.2%. And that's using a a diet composed of 40% co-product, 13% roughage in the case we're using strictly prairie hay, about 38% corn, and the balance being our supplement. And the concern is ad-libbing cattle, providing full-feed calves, provides perhaps the smaller, more timid calves in a pen the opportunity to follow behind the more aggressive eaters and to assure that they get their, their needs met. With limit feeding, our initial concern is the feed is provided in a limited fashion to all calves. And the concern is that these timid calves would not have their opportunity and thus the uh, larger, more aggressive calves would eat more than their designated amount of 2.2% of dry matter. So your objective then in this study was to see if adjustments in that bunk space, that available space that all calves could eat from, would make a difference here. Exactly. And and we're cognizant of our producers out in the state making the best use 
of their available bunk line and their apron, the dollars required for purchasing bunks, the uh, 12-foot concrete apron to really do things right. It's and not it, cheap. <laughs> it, it's certainly not cheap. It's perhaps escalating even more since when we finished up our last string of, uh, for our calves here a year ago, October. But we're trying to make the most of what we have and helping producers to better estimate numbers of animals they can do should they look at limit feeding as an option for their operations. Then talk, if you would, about the parameters of your study. You actually were feeding calves brought to the Beef Stalker Research Unit here at Kansas State University, and you tried out various spacing intervals. Exactly. And and I should first say conventionally recommendations for limit feeding calves for the size of calves that we're bringing in, about five 550 pounds. You want an allotment, at least we thought an allotment of 18 inches per head. So with the running linear footage of bunk line you have, I mean, a producer may be less apt to put as many calves in their limit feeding. So we designated four treatments looking at either 10 inches per animal, 15, 20, and certainly to the other side at 25 inches. So four different treatments with different inches allowable per head for the bunk space when they were being fed. And you conducted this over a 58-day feeding trial, correct? Yes, sir, a 58-day feeding trial. And we also followed these calves afterwards into a double stock grazing system to look at any potential gain that might have been compensatory any kind of suggestion that we might be impacting calf health or performance with these four different allowances for bunk space. And to round out the particulars, a single feeding per day, correct? A single feeding per day, and and to give the listeners an idea, these these limit-fed diets are provided once a day, and in a form that these calves are fed, the bunks are basically stripped clean by about six hours. So those bunks are dry and clean for the remaining 18 or so hours of the day where those calves sit down and ruminate, and they basically are conditioned to be fed once a day. And the other aspect, we talk about manure reduction and improvement efficiency. The other thing in working with my colleague, Dr. Tarpoff, our extension beef veterinarian, is the enhanced ability for detecting cattle health. If a calf is to be fed in the morning and is not anxious about being at the bunk to be fed with a limited amount provided to the entire group, that should help the cattle observer the opportunity to to ascertain a potential problem with a calf that's not anxious to want to eat. Important point right there. Then to your results, and you took readings, if you will, on gain, on final body weights and on the impact of these various bunk spaces on the eventual feeding efficiency of these calves. Yeah, basically when it was all said and done over uh, the first 58 days that these calves were fed, we only saw a upward increase in performance on the 20 inches per animal. And it was not significant when you looked at it from a linear fashion. Feed to gain efficiency, there was no significant differences. There was a slight tendency for uh, some improvement in efficiency for those calves provided more bunk space, but nonetheless, it was not uh, significant. Following these calves into a 90-day double stock grazing system, when it was all said and done, we saw an improvement in average daily gain from those calves that were allotted the 10 inches of bunk space per head, going back to the original design of the experiment. But overall performance, uh, in terms of express as total body weight gain, there was no significant difference. So a a producer, if he had to add an extra 5 or 10% calves to to an existing bunk setup, if you will, he or she can get by just fine with their facilities. And again, we did this project uh, being mindful, just trying to understand with limit feeding what the requirements for bunk space were and also appreciating the vast cost of investment for feeding facilities. And so we were able to look at this and, and we feel very comfortable with these results. That really is the message here. It can put a producer's mind at ease as far as their feeding facilities and what they can still accomplish with a limit feeding program with the absence of drawbacks, according to the bunk space that you allotted in this research. 
Dale, before we let you go, we might just note it's this kind of research that will be highlighted for producers to hear about and see about at the upcoming Cattlemen's Day at K-State. It's not long from now at all. That's right. Uh, just a little over a month and a long hiatus since we dealt with this uh, pandemic. Uh, we're going to s- start our program this year on Friday, the first Friday of March the 4th. And really excited. We have new leadership in our Cattlemen's Day. Our, our co-chairs, Dr. Justin Wagner out of southwest Kansas and Dr. A.J. Tarpoff here on campus, uh, they put together a really good program. And uh, we're excited to, to try to get back to life as normal as we knew it. And it's looking pretty good. And we want to make people aware of this longstanding traditional program our department has, has sponsored. We won't pour through the details here today. We're going to get into those here in the coming days. But we would invite you producers to go to ksubeef.org where the just finalized agenda for Cattlemen's Day 2022 has been posted. But do, by all means, get it on your calendar for Friday, March the 4th at Weber Hall and Arena. This year's event with all the traditional trappings, the trade show, the Fine brisket meal on site, the legacy bull sale to conclude the day, and again, loads of great speakers and breakout sessions for you producers. Again, all the details, including the registration form at ksubeef.org. So check that out. Be sure to be in attendance for that. But, Dale, for the overview of this interesting work on limit feeding calves and facilitating that via adequate bunk space, we thank you. You bet, Eric. And that's from beef cattle nutritionist Dale Blassie, K-State Research and Extension. And we'll be back with more for you shortly on this Agriculture Today. We're back now on Agriculture Today. You'll recall in our last couple of visits with Professor of Agricultural Law and Taxation, Roger McOwen of the Washburn University School of Law. We went through Roger's top 10 agricultural law and taxation developments for the calendar year 2021. As you know, that's not an exhaustive list when it comes to important developments in this arena over a given year. So, Roger, what we wanted to do today is go over a few of those that did not make the top 10. Let's call them honorable mention candidates for that list, but developments last year that nonetheless are pertinent and important to agricultural producers out there. And let's begin with this one, and it's very directly germane to agricultural producers, and that is the ever-shifting sands of the Endangered Species Act. And and this has gone back and forth in the last couple of years. Well, it sure has, Eric. And basically what we're talking about here uh, is the regulations under the Endangered Species Act dealing with the definition of habitat and critical habitat for an endangered or threatened species. And this is really important for agriculture because uh, about half of the species that are listed as endangered or threatened have about 80% of their habitat on privately owned land. So if you're a farmer or a rancher that turns out to be in the wrong spot, in the wrong location, so to speak, uh, has one of these critters show up on your private property, then your farming activities can be substantially restricted because it might interfere with that species' habitat. And we've had various types of regulations over the past few years. Again, it's tied to the politics of it, what party is in control and what's the policy uh, in terms of defining habitat that uh, landowners have to be aware of. Where does it stand, the definition of critical habitat? Or is that clear right now, given the uh, changeover in administration and the interpretations that came with that? Well, I think it's clear where things are headed, but if we step back for a moment and go back into the Trump administration, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is the agency that is responsible for writing the rules that implement the Endangered Species Act. And back in 2019, the agency published some final rules regarding the listing of species and and the protections of their habitat. And those rules clarified the procedures and the criteria that are used to add or remove species from the endangered or threatened species list and how their critical habitat is designated. It really, what they were trying to do in 2019 was sync up with a U.S. Supreme Court decision in 2018 
where the U.S. Supreme Court said you cannot include in the definition of critical habitat for a species areas where the species hasn't lived for decades. The species move around, they change, they move locations, and, and what was at issue down in the southeastern part of the United States with respect to a particular species was that landowners were complaining that the species hasn't shown up in our area in decades. They've moved. Please delist our area as critical habitat so that we can conduct our farming operations uh, without these restrictions. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, you, to be critical habitat, it must first be habitat. And if the critters don't live there, then that cannot be habitat. So it was a uh, common sense, I call it a common sense decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. So here comes the Fish and Wildlife Service in 2019 saying, well, we're going to rewrite our rules to follow what the U.S. Supreme Court said in 2018. And then we had further developments late in the Trump administration in, in late in 2020 that became effective one day before that administration's term ended in January of 21. And what it did was modify the definition of habitat to make habitat designations less burdensome on private property owners and clarifying when the government can exclude certain areas from designation as critical habitat by confining that definition to simply the ecosystem that a species presently occupied rather than the historical range of the species. And those, those rules became effective January 19 of 2021. And then, of course, you get a new administration on the next day. And in essence, the move by the new administration was to reverse that, in effect? Yeah, uh, wipe it out. Uh, on the very next day, the, the White House indicated that it would be reviewing those Endangered Species Act rules pursuant to an executive order that was issued on the very first day of the new administration. And indeed, in October of last year, the Fish and Wildlife Service published proposed rules that would rescind the Trump administration's critical habitat rule. And now they say that the Fish and Wildlife Service says, well, we don't agree that areas have to be excluded from designation when the costs exceed the benefits if it won't result in the extinction of a species. And they are not applying the Trump administration rule anywhere in the country. So the pendulum swings back the other direction, and private property owners, farmers, and ranchers need to be aware of that. And it's worth noting before we part this topic that there is a, a pending case out of New Mexico that was uh, appealed in August of last year, which perhaps may lend more clarity to this as we move forward. That's right. Uh, we had a, a court case I involving the Northern New Mexico Stockman's Association, and they did file an appeal in that case in August of last year. The ranchers did. They're claiming that the Fish and Wildlife Service acted in an arbitrary and capricious manner when it ignored the costs and benefits of designating critical habitat for the New Mexico meadow jumping mouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would win that case if the old rules are applied, which is when they filed the case. We'll have to see what happens uh, on appeal with the new proposed rules. Uh, we'll see what happens. The U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, of which Kansas is a part, by the way, so we pay attention to uh, what the Tenth Circuit says in Kansas. They heard oral arguments um, on the appeal on January 21, so just a few days ago. But uh, broadly, something that producers obviously have to keep on their radar, that is the, the Endangered Species Act and the critical habitat rules involved in that, how those affect landowners. The other things we wanted to pick up today, well, it's a selection of tax developments in 2021. And Roger, there's actually a whole slew of these that you've highlighted. Let's take a look at a couple of them, including an IRS procedural matter. Talk about that. Yeah, we did have a couple of important, well, we had numerous important uh, IRS procedure issues that came up last year. One of those involves a federal estate tax return. For the large estates that have to file a federal estate tax return because there is a tax liability, if you get a closing letter from the IRS, that does not mean that the IRS cannot later come back in and examine the federal estate tax return. Mm -hmm. So that's something that was kind of an eye-opener for practitioners that deal in this area. You would think that once you get the closing letter from the IRS involving the estate, which in turn involves the return that's been filed for the estate, the federal estate tax return, that that then takes that Form 706 off the table and they can't look at it again. And the IRS put out a 
a chief counsel advice, which means it's from the D.C. office of IRS, the national office. They said, no, uh, IRS, we can still reopen and reexamine the estate tax return to determine estate tax liability if there's evidence of fraud or collusion or malfeasance or misrepresentation. And there's a clearly defined substantial error based on an established IRS position. In other words, you took a position clearly contrary to an IRS position. Or there's some type of uh, circumstance indicating that a failure to reopen the case would be a serious administrative omission. So within those boundaries, uh, just simply having a state tax closing letter may not necessarily mean that everything's over. Yeah. Let's squeeze in one more item here. And Roger, you say this is starting to come forth in rural areas in parts of the country, and you're hearing about it. It's about the per diem allowance for meals that might be considered business-oriented meals, whether you can deduct those costs. What was the interpretation that came forth here recently? Well, under the Internal Revenue Code, a deduction for any expense uh, associated with food or beverage generally is limited to 50 percent of the amount otherwise deductible. That was a rule change that came in uh, starting in 2018. We moved away from potentially 100 percent deductible now to 50 percent as an ordinary necessary business expense, uh, as long as it's not lavish or extravagant under the circumstances. And there's particular regulations on that. But then we had some of this virus-related legislation that was enacted in late 20, but it's called the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, that says that the full cost of a meal expense is deductible if it's incurred after 2020 and before 23. So for years 21 and 22, for food or beverages provided by a restaurant. What they're trying to do is stimulate sales by restaurants. So let's give incentive to businesses to go to a restaurant and buy food. Now, it doesn't say that it has to be consumed at the restaurant. It just has to be provided by a restaurant. The problem we've got here in ag, IRS says meals obtained from a convenience store do not qualify. Now, that's a problem in rural areas because that convenience store in many areas of small town uh, rural America, in the Plain States, for example, that's all you've got. Is you've got a convenience store that's got some tables where you can sit at, you can buy uh, food there, they're preparing the food, but it's a gas station and it's a convenience store. They're saying, IRS is saying, no, you can't count your meals purchased there. Your farmhands go into town, maybe 10 miles away, go to the convenience store, they sit down, they, they have lunch, uh, they use their per dream allowance to uh, purchase that, and they're saying that's not a deductible business expense. Hmm. That is a problem, and we're trying to work with some of the tax writing committees in the Congress to get the IRS to understand that, particularly in rural areas, that really is a restaurant. So we'll see where this goes. Well, stay tuned for more on that, and we'd remind folks that these that we've covered today are just a small part of the wealth of information and topics that Roger covers regularly on his blog at the website washburnlaw.edu slash W-A-L-T-R. We'll see what's up next time we visit in a couple of weeks, Roger. Many thanks. Thank you, Eric. From the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McGowan on this Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. Each year, I like the tree less and less. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. When we bought the house, the tree was just a sapling. It was nothing like the trees we had planted and left behind many years ago now in Virginia. Actually, this was an ugly tree. But it was a tree, and there were not many trees around the house we had bought here on the edge of Manhattan. The tree I'm talking about was just an elm tree, a seedling. But I let it grow. As I said, there were few trees here on the hill. As it grew and reached well over the roof of the house, the winter ice storms did not help it any. It only became uglier. From the bedroom window we looked at its trunk, which grew thicker and thicker each year. And each year I liked the tree less and less. 
one year I brought home a lace bark elm. It too is an elm, but it's a fascinating tree with a beautiful lacy bark. And it does not suffer from the elm disease, nor does it break up like what I call the bastard elm. The tree I planted has grown well, and it needed growing space. So I decided that the elm tree which irritated me had to go. I had mentioned it to my son, and one day a small crew drove up to the house, and with tackles and some careful planning, they brought the tree down. It fell away from the house, even though it was leaning over it. Once on the ground, the double-trunk tree was cut up into firewood pieces, which I've been burning this winter in the open fireplace. It gives good heat after having dried for a year or more. As they were cutting it up, I saved one piece of the straight trunk. It's only five feet long and 18 plus inches in diameter. They saved that as I saw some use for it as a rustic bench. Later, they rolled it to the base of the old and twisted Osage orange tree standing away from the house but on the edge of the lawn. I mow. I love that tree. It's an old, very old tree put together of three twisted trunks which are wrapped around each other with far-reaching branches to the side. It's a female tree producing the beautiful and slightly sticky hedge apple. It's the hedge apple which fascinates me now as it feeds the squirrels. The squirrels are descendants of those which climbed the trunk when the bastard elm was still standing. They used to climb up the trunk and sit and look in through the bedroom window. No privacy. But with the tree gone, they no longer can do that. But now they enjoy the five feet long trunk I saved and rolled to the base of the old Osage orange tree. It rests against the orange tree and is raised off the ground on two heavy, short cross pieces. It's a good place to sit in the shade and look into the yard when the weather is warm. Right now, it looks like a diner countertop in a bar. The squirrels have taken over. They manage to take the hedge apples whole or chunks, and open them up looking for the seeds while sitting on top. The flat trunk is all green with juicy, sticky hedge apples all chewed up. When I look out of the window, it's quite a sight. A snack bar for the critters. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. Thanks, as always, for being along with us. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.